Cool. All right. So this is there's a little feedback. Uh, my first time in South Africa. It's beautiful here, and the people have been so friendly. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conference. So I'm very happy to be here. As Jonathan said, my name is Bethany Macri. I'm on the core platform team at Etsy. And that is an infrastructure team. And actually, if you were at ScaleConf last year and saw Maggie Jo give her talk about logical sharding, uh, Maggie and I work together on the same team. So the core platform team is an infrastructure team. We build the infrastructure on top of which our product engineers build features at Etsy. And in this talk, I'll be discussing three major infrastructural changes that we've made at Etsy that have enabled us to scale. I'm curious who's heard of Etsy. Can I see? OK. All right, well, for those of you who have not heard about Etsy, um, it is a platform that allows people to buy and sell handmade and vintage goods, both on and offline. I'll be using listings from Etsy in this talk to demonstrate what I'm talking about to give you a feel of what people buy and sell. Just some statistics. We were founded in 2005 in Brooklyn. We're still a Brooklyn-based company, and we've grown immensely since this time. For example, we now have 36 million items for sale and 22 million active buyers. We transact in nearly every country in the world. This means that as we've grown, we've had to scale such that we can accommodate different languages and transacting in multiple currencies. We've also expanded our offices. Here are some pictures of our offices from around the world. We have nine different offices in seven countries. We have about 800 employees now, 51% of which are women. My point in discussing these statistics and showing you our locations around the world is to provide a backdrop for the reasons for having to adapt our infrastructure in order to scale. But before I get to that, I want to mention that Etsy is a registered B Corp, meaning we are a for-profit company certified by the nonprofit B Lab. In order to be certified, a company has to meet high standards of social and environmental accountability and transparency. This affects decisions that we make about how to scale. For example, we don't just throw hardware at a problem because, because that leaves a bigger carbon footprint. I want to tell you now a little bit about Etsy engineering culture. Our motto is code as craft. I believe we practice code as craft in two major ways. Uh, the first is that more senior engineers will take under their wing more junior engineers. And in that way, we kind of follow the apprenticeship model. And the second is the practical ways that we practice our craft. And I'll go over three things that I believe we do exceptionally well as we uh, hone our craft. The first is that we practice continuous integration. We push to the site roughly 35 times daily. As Michael was saying, a push is not a release. The thought behind it, this is that uh, it increases the safety of our system. A small change is easier to write, it's easier to test, it's easier to code review, it's easier to fix, and it's easier to back out. Any failure is kept small because your change is small. Or if the failure is catastrophic, it's at least easy to identify. The second thing we do quite well is that we measure everything. We're a metrics-driven organization. We measure everything, and we graph what we measure. We then alert on our graphs, whether through automated pages or by being easily able to identify an anomaly that we've graphed. The final thing that we do as part of our uh, engineering practice that is less technical but is a very big part of our engineering culture is that we conduct blameless postmortems. We recognize that bugs will occur in a sufficiently complex system. That's a foregone conclusion. This does not mean that no responsibility is taken when, for example, an outage occurs. What it does mean is that rather than pointing blame at an individual or a set of individuals for an outage or failure, we examine the event as a failure of the system that we've created, and we investigate the set of circumstances around the failure and consider how we can make the system safer. In addition to the cultural practices that I've discussed, there is a specific technical story to tell around how we've scaled since our inception in 2005 as a small Brooklyn-based company. This talk will be a retrospective in which I will tell that story. I'll reflect on three major infrastructure projects that we've accomplished in order to scale. But first, what do I even mean by scale? What am I talking about when I'm discussing the scalability of our system? Before looking up the definition of scalability, I tried to put it in my own words. 
and I came up with, it's the ability of a program or system to continue to function as it or its inputs grow in size and or quantity. But truthfully and not surprisingly, Wikipedia puts it more elegantly. Scalability is the capability of a system, network, or process to handle a growing amount of work or its potential to be enlarged in order to accommodate that growth. I'll discuss Etsy's growth in terms of the number of users and therefore increased traffic and increased data that we would need to store, including more shops, more listings, and more images. Growth in terms of our code base, which like any other would grow in complexity over time. Growth in terms of the number of engineers. We have over 200 now. And growth in terms of the number and the complexity of the features that we would want to and need to implement for our users. So I'll be talking about three things. The first is sharding. This is a four-year data migration project. The second is creating a new version of our API, v3. And the third is creating a new data access pattern for our big data. First, I'll discuss sharding. When we began, we had a single Postgres database with many tables. This prevented a problem for us for several reasons. First, it was a single point of failure. We, ex we experienced downtime as we failed over to the secondary during an outage or uh, in order to do a schema change. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned previously, we practiced continuous integration. And our Postgres schema had stored procedures in it. These were hard to debug, and there was no way to easily hack on the schema and deploy it. We also, at the time, were using the best hardware that was available, so there was no way to continue to scale vertically. We also uh, had a bad experience, and there's a backstory here. Uh, years ago, the photo sharing site Flickr, uh, when President Obama, Obama was actually running for president, he created a Flickr account. And it became so popular that the Flickr database became flooded with connections and the site went down. Many of our engineers we actually inherited from Flickr. So when this happened uh, at Flickr, the Flickr engineer said, never again. We'll split our data onto many databases and we'll all allow ourselves the ability to migrate the data, the data in the event that we need to rebalance the load. The Flickr engineers implemented that solution at Flickr and then came to Etsy. At Etsy, we call these databases the shards, except they don't really look like this because how would you find anything in this mess? They look more like this. For redundancy purposes, each shard has two sides, side A and side B. Both sides have the same data. It's a master-master setup. We chose to shard in this way so you can load balance the writes and the reads on both sides. It also allows us seamless schema changes, which I'll discuss later. So here's a brief overview of how the shards work. A request comes in from the internet, hits our PHP application. We go get an ID from what we call the ticket server, and I'm gonna zoom in on the ticket server here because this is important. Side A of the ticket server has only odd numbers. We accomplish this with a simple uh, increment two statement in the schema. Side B has only even numbers. Requests are routed randomly to either side A or side B. You really don't want your uh, provisioning IDs to be a single point of failure. In this way, we are able to guarantee globally unique primary keys. The reason for this is that sometimes we need to migrate data between databases. That's the entire point of sharding. And we need our primary keys to be globally unique in order to do this. MySQL cannot guarantee uniqueness across physical and logical databases. So this is critical for sharding. After getting what will be our globally unique ID, we then go to the, what we call uh, index, which is a lookup table, and record on which shard the record will be written. You'll see that like the ticket server, index is represented by two databases. The purpose here, though, is redundancy in the case that we need to fail over. These replicants have a master-master relationship, unlike ticket server. Uh, reading from both sides is load balanced, and the shard number that we write to is picked randomly. Very simple. Finally, we write to the shards. This means that all of a user's data is on the same shard. All of a shop's data is on the same shard, et cetera. This is a performance optimization, as it's preferable than having to find many records from across all of the shards. 
you'll see here that the shards are also replicants. And here I'll get back to how this helps us with schema changes. After I take a drink of coffee, not whiskey, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, you'll see here that there's a replicant. So in order to accomplish a schema change, first we take side A out, apply the schema change to that. Meanwhile, side B is still in and serving requests. We put side A back in, take site B out, apply the schema change to it, put it back in. So sharding allowed us to scale horizontally. It also allowed us to gain resiliency and performance, and also expertise in our system, and better integration with our continuous deployment environment. This was crucial. Our data is the beating heart of our organization. Our customers depend on it. Our customer support and Etsy admin depend on it. Our financial reports depend on it. Having this data be correct and accessible is crucial. But accuracy and availability of the data is useless if our product engineers cannot access it in a performant, practical way. And that's why we had to scale our API and write the third and current version of the API, API v3. So first, let me talk a little bit about v2 because there were good parts of it. Uh, it followed a fairly traditional model view controller setup. So I'm assuming most of you are familiar with that. I'll go over it very briefly. A request comes in and gets directed to a controller. Uh, we can then go get data from a model. Populates the data, with, uh, the data populates the view. And the response gets rendered by the view. Now I want to step back to the data access layer um, for a minute and explain something. At Etsy, each table that we have has a corresponding model called an Etsy model. API v2 was written to make it easy to take an existing Etsy model and make it available via a JSON HTTP API. Each Etsy model can establish relationships, either one-to-one -one or one-to-many, to other models using associations to mirror relations in database schemas. So here is an example of what would be on, say, the listing model. We've added an association to the shop model, connecting it with the shop ID. The problem is the API v2 framework exposed these associations as include parameters to endpoints. This meant that a client could request a shop and additionally ask for listings and uh, from that shop to be included in the response, for example. Both shop and listings would be returned in the resulting response, saving the client from making a second request. This actually turned out to be a really powerful concept for uh, API clients, including our own mobile native apps. It proved to be so powerful, in fact, that when we released our first iPad app, no additional endpoints needed to be written. Everything could be sourced from existing endpoints with appropriate include parameters. But with the good comes the bad, and several aspects of v2 presented some issues when it came to supporting the API long term. The first was the include pass I just mentioned. Though associating objects via include pass was amazingly useful for clients, this flexibility also had implications when it came to server side performance. A client could arbitrarily control the complexity of a given endpoint via request parameters. This meant that runtime latency measurements had huge variance. For example, if the 95th percentile of a given endpoint increased, it wasn't immediately clear if this was related to an overloaded backend data store or a client suddenly started to request additional included resources. The second issue was the mapping to the schema that v2 uh, supplied. As API v2 made it very easy to expose an existing or a model as a RESTful API resource, it meant that the schema of the API was a snapshot of the model at that point in time. This one-to-one -one mapping uh, posed problems when we subsequently performed data migrations or restructured the schema of the model. We always had to think in terms of backwards compatibility at that point. Additionally, because there was some implicit framework magic arising from reflecting on a model to determine endpoint behavior, it made uh, unit tests more difficult. There was also the issue of duplicated logic that was not a requirement of V2, but was a result of it. And let me show you what I mean. 
Developers would build a web controller to format the data into something that could be passed along to a template and then rendered in the browser. Then they'd add business logic so they could access data from the database. Mobile devices were sort of an afterthought or secondary concern. Developers would then build V2 endpoints to get all of their resources, and then oftentimes use different business logic to get the data from the database. So we would end up with this really awkward split where the integration or common point was the database. And some of the business logic of the layer was shared between them, but as anyone who's done uh, MVC knows, it's very hard to fight against controllers growing fatter with time. And so they end up with far too much business logic in them. And that makes it difficult to reuse them. So you see that the MVC architecture for web pages led to developer bad habits, primarily adding logic to controllers rather than models, and at times, and this is really bad, executing data fetch queries during rendering templates. This meant that logic had to be recreated in API v2 endpoints, leading to potential inconsistencies and missing functionality otherwise available on the website. And this was perhaps the biggest problem because we weren't in this world anymore, which is to say we were no longer in a desktop only or a primarily desktop world anymore. We were in this world. The majority of our traffic was coming from mobile devices. And in this world of clients making requests from mobile devices, we were losing too much time making HTTP requests from around the world back to our origin, our database. Our uh, data center, sorry. We had the ability for the client to ask for associations and include paths, as I mentioned, that were relationships between resources. But you couldn't do such a thing as, for example, get a listing and know whether the browsing user had favorited that listing. Um, so the iPhone app, for example, had to make two different requests in order to get that information. In fact, for most client views in our native apps, you had to make more than one request. And this added up to a lot of latency in our native applications. Now, we have a monolithic code base, and uh, we do run a LAMP stack, and I'm glad that included in the code of conduct is that, conduct is that you're not allowed to throw stones at uh, the choice of language of the organization. Um, much of our application is written in PHP. As you probably know from your laughter, I can tell that you probably do know that PHP is a single-threaded language, and that although it's possible to manage fork processes in PHP, this doesn't really play well in the context of a pre-forked web server, such as Apache, where each Apache child hosts its own PHP interpreter. So with threads and forked processes essentially off the table, there's not much to explore in terms of concurrency primitives. So with this problem in mind, one of our engineers uh, from the core platform team actually visited Netflix to spend time with their API team. They, Netflix, have a much bigger proliferation of devices. They support thousands of different devices. And what Netflix decided to do is have their API team not support all of these devices, but instead give the device team the ability to change their API to match the requirement of the particular device. Netflix does this by offer, offering a scripting layer on top of their API, so the device team can write APIs only for what they need. From this visit, uh, this particular engineer, Paul, brought back two ideas that would be the building blocks of our API v3. This is the idea of two different kinds of endpoints, component and bespoke. Component endpoints are generic resources for all clients. It's a pretty traditional RESTful endpoint. It returns a generic resource and its domain object of some type in our system. So for us, a listing, a shop, a member. Bespoke endpoints are sort of the V3 special sauce. Uh, it's written with one client in mind. The idea is you can go find a bunch of these domain objects and compose them into a single response to return to the client. So the requests are now tailor-made to the client. They're free to make requests to endpoints that make sense for them, and they have a mapping of one client call to one client view. This pushes complexity to the server. So the idea is that we can bundle up a bunch of stuff that the client would have done and instead move it onto the server. This was a very compelling reason for developers to adopt the new API. They could get much faster responses. So let me show you how Bespoke works. A response comes in to, uh, a request comes into our uh, Bespoke API, it goes to a cache. Any cache miss then hits our component API, 
So why is this faster? This is a single HTTP request, and all of this happens within one data center. So we've effectively removed latency that would happen by making multiple HTTP requests from outside our data center. And I wanna show you um, a little bit of code, uh, an example of a bespoke endpoint. First, the root is specified. So unlike v2, you know that one endpoint always maps to one root. This makes performance monitoring as well as unit testing much more straightforward than in v2. Here's where we build up values that we'll later use as our component calls. And here we execute the resolve on each element. Resolve is effectively using a non-blocking HTTP request to each of the values, which uh, remember our client calls passed in as arguments. And lastly, I wanna call attention to the fact that this endpoint is an implementation. And uh, interfaces I love primarily because they model the crucial behaviors that need to be supported by any implementation. I think that having our endpoints implement a common interface makes it clear for our developers what exactly needs to happen in order to build a working endpoint. It's much easier to debug and it has been a boon to us both for educational and debugging pur purposes as we've continued to expand the number of engineers we have. So whereas before, as I mentioned, we have this awkward split in V2, for all the reasons we now write all of the V3 endpoints first. So you build your V3 endpoints and we'll point both the web and our native mobile apps at these endpoints. And it follows that these endpoints are backed by unduplicated business logic. So we now have an API that can be at the center of product development and we call this API first. By writing a new version of our API, we made it easier for our product engineers to access our data and iterate quickly on products. It was easier to write, you only had to write one thing in one place, and it allowed us to might write more features faster. It also enabled us to scale in terms of the devices we supported. We were building uh, for mobile devices in addition to the web, instead of building primarily for the web and then thinking about mobile sort of after. And perhaps most importantly, I made our native apps faster. But a big problem still remained, and this is a problem for any company operating at scale. And that is, what are you going to do with your so-called big data? And that brings me to my third and final piece of infrastructure that we changed in order to scale at Etsy, our big data access pipeline. So we have a lot of data stored on our shards. And as I mentioned in the first section, we've taken great care to ensure that it's accurate and accessed in a performant way. But we also wanna make this data and present it in a unique, meaningful, and useful way for our customers. We wanna take the data and be able to perform analysis on it such that we can view it in a new way. For this, we have wonderful, brilliant data scientists. They create what we call data sets for features that you may have seen on the site if you use Etsy. Similar listings within a shop, recommendations denoted by our picks for you, and they also allow us to do search ranking experiments using data sets to rank listings by different terms. Our data scientists write Hadoop jobs that are stored in HDFS, the Hadoop file system. As soon as the data is stored on HDFS, we call it a data set. Now Hadoop is very useful for analyzing data and gen generating aggregate data. But the read latency on Hadoop is very slow. The latency is so high, in fact, that we cannot afford to read directly off of Hadoop from our monolithic application. The latency, just to give you a sense, is over two seconds. This kind of latency would be unacceptable to us and to our users. So the implied solution is moving the, the data off of HDFS but the question remains, to where and how will we move terabytes of data and millions of rows? We could have used the shards. Uh, however, this operation would have had to have been heavily throttled. We can't just load millions of rows onto the shards through a fire hose. That would cause performance issues on the shards. There was also the issue um, that this would require a schema change every time you made a change to the data set as a field in a data set would correspond to a column on a table. As I mentioned, our schema changes incur no downtime for us, but we only do them once a week. 
So this development life cycle would have, made, would have been terribly slow for a data scientist making a change to a data set. Sleeve lag would have also been an issue on the shards. Inserting millions of rows onto the shards would have caused enormous sleeve lag. Even though our sharded architecture isn't set up as a master sleeve, until a record is written to both, slot, both sides, the side that has not yet been written to is technically the slave of the other side between the two sides of the shards. So we explored Redis. For those of you who don't know, Redis is an open source key value store. It's a data structure server. It's very fast to load, and unlike the shards, there would be no schema changes required, which means that the data si scientists could iterate quickly on their data sets. It's also really fast to read from Redis, so our product engineers would be able to access the data quickly to use data sets as part of their features. This is because all of the data is stored in memory, and this is really important because it caused us some big problems. When a node went down, because all of the data was in memory, we chose not to use Redis persistence, by the way, we would temporarily lose the data. It was really unstable for us for this reason. Uh, also, due to a configure error on, configuration error on our part, uh, the OOM killer would actually kill Redis in production, and because all of the data was in memory, um, we would have to rebootstrap the node, and this took about 10 hours. I'm not bad-mouthing Redis at all, we just didn't know how to operate it at the time. Uh, lastly, scaling memory is expensive, and there's no way to predict how much we would need in the future. So in terms of the aforementioned instability, there was no end in sight, so to speak, while using Redis. So we needed a solution that wasn't a memory-backed data store for our data sets. But the problem remained, we cannot ship tens of terabytes of data to our web servers, and clients still need to access this data remotely from the web servers. So we took a step back and took some time to think about the problem. In fact, there was a retreat to uh, visit the, uh, an engineer on our team who works remotely, In uh, he works from Arizona. This, if you don't recognize it, is a necklace in the shape of Arizona. And because we were in Arizona we, and solving this problem, we chose to call this Project Arizona. For Project Arizona, we decided to leverage something we already knew how to operate fairly well, PHP, and combine it with SQLite, which would provide the client of the data set, our product engineers, with the ability to access the data set in a performant way. The major change here was that we were moving from a solely in-memory store to a store backed by disk. So let me show you what the Arizona system looks like that we built. As I mentioned, our data scientists write Hadoop jobs. The Hadoop job is then stored in HDFS, as I mentioned, that's the Hadoop file system. When the job is stored in HDFS, it's marked as generated and hits what we called the conductor. And the conductor is actually just a collection of V3 endpoints. Uh, this endpoint creates a row in a database signaling that a data set has been generated and stored into HDFS. There's then a piece of the system called the transformer, and the transformer is actually a very important, crucial part of the system. It does four things. The first thing it does is ping the conductor regularly to ask if any data sets have been generated. The second thing the transformer does is read the generated data set from HDFS. The third thing the transformer does is what we call baking. It bakes the Hadoop job in chunks called part files into SQLite files. And lastly, the transformer ships these SQLite files to the Arizona server. The client, most commonly a feature from our application, uh, can then access the data set simply by curling the key that the data set is stored by. By creating a resilient big data pipeline, we were able to scale what data sets meant at Etsy. We could now store more data sets on the data set server and still access them consistently and quickly. This was an advantage to us not only because we could build more features and, uh, that requested the data sets, it also allowed us to store multiple versions of the same data set on the server so we could roll back in the event that a failure occurred on the data set. I would offer that it also allowed us to scale in terms of what we were able to offer our customers who could now have a more curated experience on the site. So in this section, I'm going to reflect on what we've learned through scaling these pieces of infrastructure. As I mentioned really early in the talk, at Etsy we conduct blameless postmortems. 
As such, we are very conscious of counterfactual language. Uh, that's, for example, if I had known X, I would have done Y. The fact is, we didn't do what we should have done or what we would have done if we had different or more information or what we could have done. We did what we did, and that's what I've detailed in this talk. And while I hesitate to be counterfactual, I want to share with others what we've learned through our scaling journey. After all, that's the entire purpose of a postmortem, to reflect on events that happened and talk about how we might create a better, safer system in the future to prevent the same mistakes from happening again. You might remember this slide. What just ship means to me is actually an encapsulation of lean software principles. Specifically, eliminate waste, decide as late as possible, and deliver as fast as possible. This mentality has enormous value, especially for early stage companies, and I believe it still shapes a large part of our engineering culture. I also think, and perhaps this will make me unpopular, that just ship, the just ship mentality can come at a high cost. And there is a balance to be considered. Code hygiene, tests, formatting standards, readability, documentation, writing tests, design patterns, these should not be forgotten. I believe that the saying, a stitch in time saves nine, expresses what I'm talking about. Before you build a piece of infrastructure, take time to think about technical debt. How will it be paid down? Who will pay it down? When will it be paid down? Another thing we've learned is to run infrastructural experiments. Our products do not get put into production and don't survive in production without being uh, tested, A-B tested first, and neither should our infrastructure. Experiments will tell you if what you're building is solving the problem you're trying to solve. For example, we did not convert the code base wholesale into V3. Instead, product teams began to build features on it one by one and measured the performance of developer velocity and response time. For Project Arizona, we moved our data sets one by one into the pipeline to compare the system, how the system uh, compared in terms of performance to Redis. In the case of data sets, we learned that faster is not always better when you're operating at scale. You need technology that's operational. People in your organization need to have at least some knowledge and preferably a few people need to have deep knowledge about the technology that's put into production. This is especially important because you need that knowledge in an on-call situation. And lastly, even with all of these lessons learned about scaling and growing a company's technology, I still believe that what Donald Knuth said is true. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. He said we should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. My point here is that you have to live in order to know what that 3% is for your organization. We had to learn what to scale and what the best solutions were for us through sometimes difficult experiences. And I think that's okay. And I think we'll continue to learn more lessons as we continue to scale. And that's what I have for you today and I'll have time for questions, I think. So your bespoke APIs are basically implemented in PHP. So you could do anything there, including business logic. Have you had cases? Including, including what? Including business logic. Yes. Because it's just PHP. Have you had cases where people have done inappropriate things in the bespoke API, and how did you manage that? Are you asking um, what prevents you from creating kind of a pathological case with fan out to component No, just points? implementing logic which shouldn't exist in the bespoke API. That should be business logic lower down. We have not had that yet, and I think that's because um, one reason is because they're all implementations of an interface, and that interface is kept so small and narrow that people have a good idea of what they're supposed to be implementing. Um, and the second reason is that there's no uh, real precedence for it. API v3 is so new, and luckily, um, the product engineers that started using it first used it correctly. And I think that's because we were working very closely with them and kind of teaching them what uh, the new version was for. And so other features were built sort of with that as a model. So that, that has not been an issue. <laughs> 
Hi, I've got a question about your, uh, the, the last slide we spoke about the SQLite databases being prepared and baked and then put onto a server. Yeah. Did you have an API over those SQLite databases or were those, were those, those database files actually shipped to the client and queried on that client's, on that client's application server? The latter. Okay. They were shipped to the server, and then uh, clients queried the server directly. Okay. So then what, op what optimizations did you do to ensure that pushing all of that data or retrieving that data was done in a, in a performant way? Because obviously that's, that's now where the bottleneck could be, is in transferring those massive files across to the client. That actually has not been an issue for us, and the reason is that it happens so rarely. So shipping occurs about once a day. So um, and the data set the data sets change um, very little between version to version. So that has not been an issue for us. Is that what you were asking? Okay. Any more questions? Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this stuff. This is great. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about the trade-offs of moving to an on-disk store when you had been trying to use an in-memory data store, just in terms of speed? I mean, I understand that faster is not better in all cases, but can you talk a little bit about th this particular use case and how that works? Yes. So um, the, the biggest downside of using Redis for us was, as I mentioned, that uh, it was not resilient in the case that a node died. Um, the advantage of using Redis was that it was lightning fast for our clients. And when we did switch to Arizona, there were actually uh, six different data sets that we could not move into the Arizona pipeline because they were much slower to access than from Redis. Uh, so we kept them in what we called the Redis fast lane. It turns out um, that the way the analysts measured that was incorrect and that we actually could move most of those data sets into Arizona without taking much of a performance hit. And luckily, uh, two of the data sets that, were, that had been in the Redis uh, fast lane were no longer being used as features on the site. So they were luckily deprecated. So it's something that we'll, I expect, we'll have to learn about and continue to optimize Arizona for, um, for speed. And also, it's something that we have to monitor to make sure that our, our clients are using good access patterns. Hi. Um, you mentioned API first. Uh, do you have any API management processes in place. Any what? Um, API management processes like speaking API um, and a process, a lifecycle process around publishing the API, testing it, and so forth. Um, any processes around managing the API? Can you be more? So in terms of uh, speaking it or oh, um, and designing it? and yes. No, I think that that's sort of what I mean with the just ship mentality. Um, so in terms of specking, I actually don't know because that's more of like a product engineer side and like they do work with their product managers. I don't think the product managers go so deep as to actually spec out endpoints. I think they leave that up to the engineers. Um, but there are no real like guardrails in place or even there are no hard and fast rules about right now whether to use V2 or V3. V3 is certainly preferred. Um, and we also encourage our product engineers to write tests for their endpoints. But there's nothing in terms of like hard and fast process. Um, just a small question I wanted to know. Did you do any um, leading up on using Amazon's EMR instead of doing the whole Hadoop cluster yourself? Can you hear? Not really. Uh, did, uh, did you um, look at using uh, Amazon EMR to do the whole Hadoop processing instead of actually having um, your own engineers do it? So instead of building your own Hadoop clusters and processing your big data, did you actually no. look at using EMR? We prefer, um, we prefer hosting our own hardware. That's part of our culture, and that's kind of ingrained in us. Um, so.
the only thing that we do use AWS for is our image storage, and that's for like cold image storage. But other than that, we host all of our own hardware. Okay, cool. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned that Redis persistence wasn't suitable for your needs. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, the reason it wasn't suitable for our needs is that at the time we were like super psyched about an in-memory store and we thought that it was going to be the cure to all of our problems and it was going to be super fast and we were really confident that we could operate it. And it turned out that we were wrong. And, um, and so I think your question is why we chose to turn away from Redis entirely instead of turning on persistence. Uh, yeah. I think we were more confident that it would be cheaper, ultimately, uh, to build a new system um, rather than continue with Redis, to continue to scale Redis horizontally and use uh, a dispatch store. Um, have you looked at moving to Apache Spark instead of using Hadoop? Wait, where are you? And yeah. Oh, Hi. can you repeat that? For some reason, I have to look at you. I don't know. <laughs> what was the question? Okay, sorry. Have you looked at moving to Apache Spark? Um, because currently using Hadoop, and I think um, Spark is, is known to be quite a bit faster than Hadoop in terms of performance. Not that I know of. We have a data engineering team that I'm frankly not familiar with their... Um, the, the decisions and questions that they're asking themselves right now and making about that piece of infrastructure. So I'm not sure if they're considering that or not. Uh, the data transformation part and banking part, do you use custom ETL tools or just your own? What? Sorry. So do you use any third-party ETL tools to transform and bake the data into the SQLite yeah. files? Or yeah. do you use your own custom... custom You're talking about the baking and shipping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wrote that code. Okay. Yeah. So did you consider any third-party ETL tools for that? Did we what? Consider any third-party ETL tools? No, I think we... I, frankly, I think we felt a little bit burnt uh, and we're kind of we're kind of retreating into what we knew, if I'm honest. And we're like, okay, PHP, we can write that, we can operate that. So we'll just write some PHP classes that would do what we need to. Hi. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, so. Uh, currently, you're making quite a strong distinction between uh, the data that's living in your shards and the data that's coming out of your uh, sort of Hadoop jobs yeah. and then that's going into the SQLite. Looking towards the future, how do you think you're going to start sort of presumably amalgamating those two things where you have some data that's coming from customers and coming from transactions, but also then some data that's coming from uh, some processing that you're doing, uh, maybe resulting from some business logic, how are you going to sort of come to a world where they all live together in some ways? So the question is how we're going to create an amalgamation of data coming from the shards and coming from Hadoop? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think of those as uh, two totally different things and the question makes me wonder if I misexplained something. Um, I hope I didn't. So I'm not sure how to answer your question. Can we talk after? Sure. Okay, great. <laughs>